too. <laughs> All right, we're rolling. Let's rock. Yeah. All right. So it is my hope that you are here to hear about crowdfunding experiences. Uh, if you're not, um, then go to wherever you're supposed to be. Or hang out here. Or know? hang out here and uh, get disappointed by the tales of woe that we're about to spin. Um, we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, we're, you're a super tiny audience. You're like nine or ten people or something. So um, uh, this is liable to turn into a bit of a conversation um, in it's two minutes. Nice. Yeah. Once we yeah. talk about what we're, what we're up to. So let's introduce ourselves first. Let's start. Oh, my name is Gil Hova. Um, I have... Um, Funded two projects on Kickstarter, uh, and I have to admit that they were pretty good successes. Uh, my first game, Bad Medicine, uh, is a party game. Uh, raised thirty thousand dollars from over a thousand backers. Uh, my second game, The Networks, oh, and that and the biggest success, the the fact that it was success, success, I shipped it. It's shipped. It's done. It's a done deal. So that means that is a successful Kickstarter to me. Did you uh, lose any money on it? Uh, I, I lost a bit of money on that, but my, my goal is to have a long-term uh, uh, self-sustaining company on it. So the first project, I'm not expecting to make money on the first project, because a lot of that has to come from sales. So I think a big thing is to not, well, we'll get into it, but a big thing is not to uh, shoot the moon on your first project. My second project, the Networks, uh, funded in September, and I got over uh, $100,000. Uh, for that one. So um, I've had um, success on Kickstarter, but at the same time, I, we can talk about uh, things you have to look out for and, you know, reasons for the success, reasons projects fail, that sort of thing. Gil started late in Kickstarter and learned from everybody's I mistakes. Learned from a lot of mistakes. Yeah. You know? I was there for you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, me too, actually. <laughs> Where are you, Mr. Drinky? <laughs> Mr. Drinky. I'm Mr. Drinky. Uh, my name is Tim Rodriguez. I am three for four on Kickstarter projects, uh, which is to say one failed. Uh, and I let it fail as opposed to canceling it mm -hmm. because I felt that that was the right outcome for that particular project. Um, yeah, I funded uh, a board game, a role-playing game, and a writer's toolkit RPG accessory thing. So I'm kind of all over the place. Uh, and they've consistently been getting better as I've learned more and people are making other mistakes for me, which is awesome, yeah. and I'm getting better at spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get really good at spreadsheets. Uh, I'm Joshua A.C. Newman. I've done four Kickstarters, uh, two role-playing games, a tactical... I'm sorry, five <coughs> Kickstarters. Oh my god, how, these, how is this happening? Uh, two, I'm sorry, no. Uh, one role-playing game, a tactical tabletop uh, Lego giant robot fighting game, a titanium bike lock, and a giant uh, Lego spaceship tactical game. Um, and I'm expecting to do some of my uh, hardcore science fiction stuff um, starting again in the near future. Because giant robots don't qualify no matter how gnarly they look. <laughs> uh, that is uh, more or less that history from uh, 2010 on, from the minute I heard about Kickstarter, my hope was that I would be able to uh, bump production values because I didn't need the, I could get the upfront funding that I would need to design something that could look the way that I wanted it to look. So that game was called Human Contact, and it's a hard and social science fiction RPG that I'm, I'm still really proud of, but those production values turn out to be really hard to keep in print, so it's out of print mm -hmm. right now. Um, why don't, uh, Tim, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your first experiences wow. and uh, tell, us, tell us about your failure. Sure. Actually, let's start with that. Yeah, the failure? Yeah. Okay, so awesome. Yeah, so uh, Hyper Reality, uh, which is the most anticipated reality TV game show role playing game of all time. Uh, it's a comedy game. It's about reality TV game shows. Um, it's funny as anything, and I discovered a handful of things. Um, there, and let me let me sort of preface this by saying I'm I'm I try to be super experimental uh, with techniques and uh, ways of going about business. So I did a weird thing with my Kickstarter campaign, and I said, okay. Here's like the inexpensive level where you get a PDF. And here's like this really big level that's about stretch goals. And 
we don't have any stretch goals yet, but you get all of them if you buy in early. Um, and it didn't attract enough attention. Apparently, not enough people think reality TV game show role playing is necessarily that fun. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, ultimately, like the people who were behind it were super into it, mm -hmm. uh, and that's partly because of word of mouth, because the game shows really well. Like when people will actually sit down and play with it, they'll be talking about it for the con. In in general, uh, that's been my experience, which is awesome. Um, but to to find random people on the internet from scratch, uh, or even from an existing network of people, and saying, "Hey, I've got this awesome reality TV game show game," people are like, "You've got." I'll be over there with uh, you know my uh, my crying index index <laughs> cards <laughs> because that's what I want to play, and I'm like, "Well, then you should play that." Mm -hmm. um, so it ended up like getting about halfway to the goal I'd set for it. Um, but I think I, it, it strikes me as an interesting failure that I learned a lot from, um, at least in part due to uh, the kind of experimental nature of the campaign that I ran. Um, and uh, also because I think that the, the crowd that got behind it was really excited about it, and I thought I thought that was like nice and successful, and it it taught me a lot about the marketing for that game and what it wasn't mm. and where it did not succeed, mm. and so I have a very cheap failure on mm -hmm. my hand, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Yeah, it's it, way better than a very expensive failure. Kickstarter, that's and that's Kickstarter's role is when you fail, you're not failing for as much money as as if you'd done it all the way. Uh, the worst case scenario with Kickstarter is not the project fails to fund. That is far from the worst case scenario. That's easy. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, the worst. The worst case is that you fund and that's not the money that you needed. Yes. Because then you have a <clears throat> your marginal profit is negative, which mm -hmm. means you're paying uh, to for people to play your game. Which I mean, if people have had to have like lost their houses over that. Yeah. Show. Yeah. I'll amend that you asked if I made money. Um, I didn't make money off of just the sales of the Kickstarter versus the revenue, but uh, what I didn't mention is that I have 700 games left over, and those will bump me over, you know. And they're, right now, sales seem to be pretty good. You know, if they sell out, then yeah, I'll have made a profit then. Right. Small yeah. profit, but a profit nonetheless. Yeah. Can I ask, where are you selling them now? Uh, if you go up to Modern Myths. Where are you selling them at, uh, yep. A... Yes, uh, just, they're, they're through distribution, so you can find it at any game store. I will point out that at 700 copies, if you're not using distribution, I would expect that profit to start coming maybe immediately. Uh, distribution is extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and you, it, it looks like, what is it? It's like 60%? Usually it's, yeah, it's about 60% discount. Yep. So that's 60%, but that's, <clears throat> you've also already paid for manufacturing and, mm -hmm. or whatever it is that you Which have to do. Which if you've done your, your time. Your math you, right, you're making about 20%. Of yeah. Right, right. So that's, um, uh, that means that if you've got 70, 700 copies, it's like you had sold um, four times as many. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sorry, if, it's like you'd sold a quarter as many hand-to-hand mm -hmm. uh, -hand at conventions. Mm -hmm. uh, distribution is an extremely expensive way to go. I don't use distribution. Um, and I make dick all money, but we all do. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it is also that I, to some extent, consider the business part of it, um, part of the price of admission. Um, and I'd rather, I mean, I've seen people, people's game companies go under because distribution didn't care about them mm -hmm. and lost in one case, 5,000 copies of some of these games. Wow. And it was just like, like he happened to be in a position where he could recover from that some. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the very least, it was profoundly demoralizing. Yeah. And the part of the problem is, like, I still see them pop up every so often in game stores. So mm -hmm. somehow, like, they found them. Like, something yeah. happened there. Distribution means, I mean, the, the arguments for distribution is it's the easiest way to scale up if your game is successful. 
you know, you could in theory scale up without distributors and Cards Against Humanity is obviously the biggest model there in terms of selling direct. Uh, Tim Fowers, who uh, sells the game Paperback, he does that, he sells direct, you know, but uh, that is very, very time consuming. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the harder way to go. You are going to make a lot more money but it's number one harder to make mo uh, harder to do it and harder to keep up with all the work. Yeah. So uh, distribution is easier to scale up uh, that way. But the downside is you're in a really big pond. You're in a big pond and you're getting paid as though this is a hobby. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which basically means the mm -hmm. the distributor feels like they're doing you a favor mm -hmm. and treats you like it. Um, so I mean, there there are reasons to do it, and there are particularly reasons to do it um, past a certain degree of uh, commercial success. Um, Burning Wheel, Luke Crane, mm -hmm. who publishes Burning Wheel and Mouse Guard and a bunch of other really neat things, uh, uses distribution because it allows him to print in enormous volumes mm -hmm. because the distributor will take enormous volumes from him. And his numbers are big enough that those curves start to cross yep. for him. But uh, he, as I would say... In, how many people here are in role-playing games? All right, so mm -hmm. this is, uh, this, I don't know these numbers on uh, on uh, board and card games, but yeah. I can, I can yeah, help. we can both help with yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but um, uh, among the, I would, I would say that the two biggest independent role-playing publishers are Fate and uh, Burning Headquarters, Burning Wheel Headquarters. Uh, and they both get paid basically minimum wage amounts of money. Um, and the fake crowd uses crowdfunding, and Luke, Luke's actually started to use it because now he has a day job at mm -hmm. Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. tells you something. Mm -hmm. It's the, the, the middlemen mm -hmm. who tend to make money on these things. Mm -hmm. so, Which is, tends to be true. Yes. Right. And so since our object here is to make money for ourselves, we do what we can to eliminate every possible middleman. And Kickstarter takes 10%. That's not that big a deal. Um, that's no 60%. Like, that's something that you can easily roll in. But uh, but it's, um, uh, it's like figuring out how to make as much of that get into your pocket as possible is what makes it so that you can make your next thing that doesn't have whatever flaws you find intolerable after <laughs> you've thought about your thing for another goddamn year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. So so let's talk about, um, I think that if we're going to talk about like experiences and sort of like spin tales of woe, mm -hmm. um, I'll share a story about Ghost Pirates, my first, <laughs> my first mistake, mm -hmm. um, as I like to call it. Um, it's, it's been a, a, solid, a solid success, which means I have not lost money on it. Mm -hmm. um, that has taken a while. Um, Ghost Pirates raised about $10,000. Uh, I think it was, what, 2011? Yeah, that sounds, sounds about that right. Sounds about right. Uh, Mid-2011. And uh, in board and card games, as opposed to books, the numbers where you start hitting uh, economy of scale uh, are pretty high. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're awesome in the 5,000 range. Mm -hmm. And the... Uh, the um, the the amount of profit that I could make on a unit of Ghost Pirates at five thousand units is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, if you move five thousand units, if I move five thousand <laughs> yeah. units, yeah. yeah, I'm still working on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I put up a, a fairly substantial chunk of my own money to make five thousand units, and I've still got about three quarters of that. Mm. Five years, like four or five years later, which kind of sucks because it hits my taxes every year. Mm. It costs me money to store mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know it's a uh, it's a burden um, thankfully it's it's a burden that I've made enough on that the money kind of is even and I also have a job outside of this which means that it doesn't hit me as hard uh, so that's good mm -hmm. um, but this it's kind of an untenable thing mm -hmm. right if if like this tries to be you know my real day job mm -hmm. um you know i will continue selling and i'm continuing to support it uh as best i can mm -hmm. because it you know 
if I sell one, it's net still profitable, but it's a trickle. And so, you know, it's not something I'm really relying on at mm -hmm. this point. Mm -hmm. um, and basically it cost me an extra month's rent every month for mm -hmm. about a year when, when the, uh, the print management company and I had a misunderstanding about how payment was working. Oh, cool. Yeah, that was awesome. Mm. So, yeah. So in uh, 2012, I think, I ran a Kickstarter for Mobile Frame Zero, which is the giant robot Lego mm. fighting game. Uh, that was something like eighty thousand dollars and a thousand people. Mm. Uh, that uh, and it's I mean that's been doing really solidly. Mm. And by really solidly, I mean at this point, I've got probably some. Uh, uh, let's call it like 800 copies left something mm. like that um, uh, and they're warehouse somewhere and they're, they, there's an online retailer not a fulfiller mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry not a not a distributor but a fulfiller mm -hmm. which is a different thing mm -hmm. uh, so you can buy them on Topodicon I pay a couple bucks it's no 30% mm -hmm. it's uh, $2 out of a $25 mm -hmm. price point mm -hmm. uh, and they go out to people and that's doing me a couple hundred bucks a month mm -hmm. Uh, this is considered Mobile Frame Zero is a substantial success. Mm. I, th I don't know for certain that it's still on the first uh, page of games. I haven't looked in a while, but the last time I checked, it was the second biggest mecha themed game on Kickstarter, which you think would be pretty big. There are a lot of mecha games there, and the one that was above it was BattleTech. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it was Robotech. Which there's no way mm. that I'm going to like. That's that's <laughs> yes. like an wow. order of magnitude yeah. more money than I can. Yeah. Which I would love to do that because mm -hmm. my game's better. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, so this is this is a this is a substantial success, and this is like I still am struggling to reap the benefits of my outstanding success. Mm -hmm. um, I did a follow up uh, called Intercept Orbit, which is gi giant robot car uh, carrier based space pirates. Um, and if that doesn't sound interesting, you're totally not my audience. Um, <laughs> uh, that one, I decided, I started off with this really limited thing. I said, all right, I know how these rules work. I know how to tweak them. I know how to turn these dials. Ran a Kickstarter. It went well. It was nerve wracking because $15,000 showed up. I need about $30,000. $15,000 showed up in the first eight hours. $20,000 showed up in the last 48 hours. Mm -hmm. It was flat in the mm -hmm. middle. I could not catch any press. It was, oh my God, it felt mm -hmm. awful. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and it's still, it cleared. And at that point, uh, once I'd gotten through that point and I started uh, really just putting everything together for uh, in pre-production, I realized there was a problem with the rules. Oh no. <laughs> and I had to go back and work out something that turned out to not be that big a deal. But the um, the hit to morale from realizing, like already this has been an extremely mm -hmm. difficult, emotionally difficult campaign. And it's an emotionally difficult thing to do, to mm -hmm. hang your coat on the hooks of every passing whim, mm -hmm. somebody who might be into your thing or not. Like, don't plan to do anything for your month that you're doing mm -hmm. it. It's, it's emotionally absolutely exhausting. Uh, have have more than one person managing it is the best advice I can possibly give you. Uh, the, right, well, well, let, let's let's yeah. talk about how how to involve other people. Yeah, because that, that's 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 another topic. Another Great. Topic. So, um, what wound up happening is my intention was like, all right, I need thirty thousand dollars. This is going to be a six month project, and uh, it was so I wound up with in a serious disagreement with a co creator along the way, which we're still working out, uh, which is not. It's not a financial thing. It's, it's just working with people is hard and, and expensive. And so in addition to, like, if this is your friend and you have a disagreement with your friend, you work your shit out. Mm -hmm. And if you have a disagreement with your friend and your friend owes you stuff, that puts an entire inverted pyramid on top of this, mm -hmm. this problem that you're trying to resolve. Mm -hmm. um, so that six-month project that was supposed to uh, make me something like $5,000 in profit and then uh, land me with a ton of stock to sell over the next few years, uh, wound up being 18 months. 
Mm-hmm. And so that's 18 months, because this is my day job. Mm-hmm. That's 18 months, or that's a year of not getting paid when I yeah. was expecting to get paid for $5,000. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, <clears throat> um, uh, that, and th- that isn't even something that went wrong in my spreadsheet. That is just like the regular entropy of the universe. Mm-hmm. That a bunch of things all sort of coincide in one place. Um, and it's, I mean, the, the emotional cost is substantial, and it's one of the reasons that you make sure you and all your people get paid. Like, nothing happens until your people are paid. Mm-hmm. And that's you, and that's your editor. Mm-hmm. Like, if, if you run out of money for the, for the print run, you pay your people first. Mm-hmm. And then you say, listen, I'm sorry, everybody, we didn't raise enough money. Um, I can give refunds, or we can scale back production or whatever. Pay your people. Because... Mm-hmm because you, you need them as colleagues and um, we're after all what makes the world go around like, yeah. I want to hear your story about working with people because it sounds like it was better oh so <laughs> yeah so the last thing I did was I teamed up with Ryan Macklin to make backstory cards and it began with him giving me a call because I have a bit of a reputation that I know how to make card games and mm-hmm. I hang out with the RPG people too so they call me which is cool um, so he comes to me and says here, tell me about cards. I'm like, this, 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 this. And it's not that hard. Um, and then I said, would you be interested in maybe working together on this? And he's like, I hadn't thought about that. I don't know. And I say, okay, let us sit. No problem, whatever. And, uh, you know, the next morning, he emails me having bounced this idea off of uh, actually a mutual friend but who's one, one who has a lot of marketing and business savvy. And he's like, yes, I'm totally in. <laughs> and, and we worked out a big contract, and that was where we had our big falling out. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I mean, it would be falling out. It was, it was an argument, and it was email, and email is hard, mm-hmm. especially when you're talking about things that you're trying to agree on. Mm-hmm. And then we had a phone call. It was fine. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, phone calls are great for that. <laughs> um, and Backstory Cards was a super success. Um, yeah. And this being my fourth Kickstarter in, I'm way better at budgeting than I was mm-hmm. way long ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, like that, that has sold through about <coughs> two thirds of the uh, initial print run. Mm-hmm. And I've got, you know, a couple hundred copies left of each. And I have made money on it already and everybody has been paid and stuff is still going on and that that's that's worked out great um but where where i was uh, mentioning that having other people active on a campaign is great is that you can split up responsibility i'm like emotional ryan right yeah the, the emotional weight of a Kickstarter yeah, campaign yeah. is enormous i would probably knock at least one of the top seven stress, most stressful things that include like death, <laughs> like in, death, the family, child, death, death in the family, death in the family, moving, losing your job, uh, yeah. you know, like all of these things. Like running a Kickstarter campaign, I think kicks something out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but like being able to rely on somebody else to say write an update when. You know, all of a sudden, like my job has me slammed at work, mm-hmm. and Ryan can like dash off like you know a thousand words of an update that says, "Hey, here's what we're doing." Mm-hmm. I'm like, click. Oh, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Or like somebody, just somebody else to answer a question that comes mm-hmm. up, because mm-hmm. then you can split up the monitoring of what's going on. Yeah, and you know, I'm still getting my phone buzzed all the time because mm-hmm. uh, it's my account that's being, mm-hmm. that it's attached to. Yeah. But just having somebody else be able to be responsive on that is huge. Yeah, my uh, I had a game before, so before my first Kickstarter project, I had a game of mine that my publisher put on Kickstarter. Uh, and this was an interesting learning experience because the first time it failed, um, but it was his Kickstarter project and not mine. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and that was actually my mentality at first. You know, I thought, well, I'm just the designer, he's the publisher, so he's just going to take care of it all. So I sat back and I'm like, okay, he's going to do in the work. And then it failed. And then I saw some comments like, well, the designer doesn't even care. He didn't. He never comes. And I'm like, well, okay, yeah, all right, that's a fair cop. So, uh, so when we relaunched.
launched, I made sure that I was there, that I was present, that I was making comments, that I was answering the questions, I was subscribed to threads, um, and that's, you know, so that was sort of the inverse that I was there for my publisher in that case. Right. So, uh, you know, in the future, um, you know, when I'm doing a Kickstarter and I do have help, you know, I, right now the help that I get for my Kickstarter is all graphic because me in graphic design usually involves a lot of swearing and a lot of crying. So and I need, a lot of common yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, no, no, thank, thank goodness You'll I know You'll a lot enough. of learning from other people's mistakes. Yes, that, that was one, that was one. I have a rule book in my bag uh, for a big deep strategy game that is literally in Comic Sans. Four hour strategy game, rule book in Comic Sans. So uh, I've learned from it's mistakes. The wrong decision. Yeah. <laughs> there were some bad decisions He's there, that was one of them. <laughs> I like trolling graphic designers, it's really fun. <laughs> Um, does anybody have questions at this point? Yeah, sure. I've got one for your one where there was the 18 month delay. Mm -hmm. How did the backers react to that? Uh, they just need me to check in with them and make sure that, like, I. So, I, so there are a couple of things that, that I've noticed happen. One is I tend to. I, I don't like to work in public. Like, I'm not a game designer because I like to do marketing, I'm a game designer because I like to design games. Uh, but when I go and, like, everybody expects delays. I think I've had one of the, like, 70 Kickstarters that I've backed where everything was delivered, like, what you would have, what you would have naively thought was going to be the delivered project, product, and when you thought it was going to come in, came in. It's, it's wonderful, by the way. It's a, it's, it's a, I've only had it, like, once. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the time, I mean, it's like, uh, in some cases, there are a couple of things. Were, like, I backed it a hundred bucks or so uh, for books and a big bibliophile, which is, actually is one of the reasons that I do this. And uh, in both cases, in one case, somebody's house burned down. Oh, wow. <laughs> right? Oh. Uh, mm. Yeah. I wonder if that was the same one that I had that I, It uh, probably that, was, yeah. That sucked. Um, and in the other case, and you will actually, if you go back, if you backed a bunch, you're like, I wonder what the statuses are here. You will find a lot of people collapsing in depression because of their successful Kickstarter. Mm, yeah, yep. and that's what happened. This guy yep. was an artist. He was he had a huge amount. I love his work. Absolutely love his work. He was making this hardcover book, and I'm like, Jesus, how are you doing this at this price point? I gotta find out who your printer is when when you're done. I'm not gonna mm -hmm. pester you right now. And it's been uh, probably two years or something like that. And the last thing from him is sort of like, I, I just can't do this. Uh, like that's basically the last I heard. I'm really flexible about these things. And like, like it's not like a hundred dollars doesn't mean anything to me, at all, because um, because I make artist money, right? A hundred dollars was a big decision for me, uh, but it is that I know that when I'm going into a Kickstarter, like I know that like I'm saying, like your best estimate is is this is what it's going to take to try something that's hard, mm -hmm. and in this case, there's this guy. He had a lot of illustrations to do. He had a lot of editorial decisions to make and all that shit, and he he couldn't go through with it. Fortunately, that hasn't happened to me to that degree. I went silent on uh, Intercept Orbit for a while uh, for two reasons. One was that somebody else, it was somebody else's account, which I'm not gonna do again. Use your name, use your face, if mm -hmm. it, at all possible. Mm -hmm. If you're doing anything that's troll bait, like to, to keep yourself safe, but, uh, but the more it's clear that it's you, the mm -hmm. closer the communication is and all that shit. So I just wasn't noticing that people were contacting me because I had my own account open. Um, once I said, all right, I'm sorry, here's where we're at. Uh, first off, don't use the refueling, uh, it actually wasn't the refueling rules, it was the fueling rules, I think, at the beginning of the game. There's no reason anybody would realize it didn't work and my math was a little bit wrong and what it basically meant was, I would guess that one game out of three was gonna be boring and that's not, and like nobody had noticed this yet. Like I, 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 I went and I, I played a few games, I was like, those odds really make your, uh, they make you play really conservatively. And it's not gonna be fun to do. And, and that, that put me in this terrible state. And so I said, all right, I, I fucked up a rule here and I haven't been able to work on this for the last couple of months or whatever. Uh, but I think I can put this back together and I'm gonna send you guys out a PDF of where it's at. Mm -hmm. And so what happened is I fixed that rule because fixing it literally took sitting down with one of the people in my creative co-op and saying, I need you to help me reason this out. Mm -hmm. We're gonna put out some spaceships and we're gonna try some stuff and see if this makes sense. It took, I literally think it took me half an hour. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, I'm just gonna 
put those paragraphs back in. And it, it was like I had to change some numbers. It was a ridiculously tiny thing that got me completely hung up. I said, all right, here's the PDF. You'll notice there's a bunch of shit missing at the back because the artist hasn't gotten that stuff or whatever. Uh, and then people were like, hey, like, we're playing. Like, here's the spaceships. We made some spaceships. Here's our games on Twitter. Like, I was like, well, you know, I could have done that four months ago, and that would have, like, given me back a year of life, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, like, mm -hmm. that, even if you're like, I'm really... There, there are a bunch of comic artists, and comic artists are as prone to depression as um, mm -hmm. game designers, it turns out. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was one, she's really, really sweet, and she was really beating herself up. And it was, like, over, like, really tiny things. She felt absolutely awful that she hadn't delivered this thing that she promised. She takes her word seriously, like most people do. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, and she was like driving herself into like health endangering depression and um, I and after a while a bunch of other people were writing to her and saying like it's cool first off this is really important to you but to us it's just a comic and we're, we gave you money because we like your work and we want to see you make more so that, that communication mm -hmm. even if it's a little bit vulnerable and again it depends on the circles mm -hmm. that you're going for like there there are fandom communities that are not safe to be vulnerable in mm -hmm. um, but uh, in general, being just as sincere with, as you can with mm -hmm. those people, even if you're in a shitty place, that sort of says, like, I haven't just run off with your money. And, yeah. You know, blown it on heroin. Mm -hmm. um, or you can say, I'm really sorry I blew it on heroin. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, you know, you can't like get blood from a stone. <laughs> yeah. I'm sort of in the... Um, so now that the networks, my project from September, are funded... Um, I've told backers uh, you can expect an update every three to four weeks. You know, uh, so and which is that's, I find a good increment. Yeah, especially post, uh, you know, post Kickstarter close because now that um, now that we're we've got everything set, all the variables are fixed, and it's just a matter of getting the art, you know, getting the art done. But like the testing is done, we've got all the stretch goals laid, uh, you know, put in stone, and we know what we're what's going to be in the box. Just a matter of filling everything out. So. Uh, it's not so important to solicit backers' input, not so important to, like, stoke the fires, but it is important to let them know that you're, uh, that still you're still make, working on it. You're, you're, you're alive and making yeah. any progress. Yes, you're, uh, that, that, that we're working on it. It's, it's you know, we're going to be quiet, but we're working on it. And uh, I don't know how it is with uh, your stuff, Josh, but I know, we, you know, with board game design and with board game publishing, um, you know, the, the copies leave the factory, they go on the slow boat, and it's like those, uh, you know, when you have that... Uh, um, when a spaceship returns to Earth and it goes through the atmosphere and there's like that seven minutes where you can't communicate with mission control, yeah. that's sort of like, but extended to a month while the products are on the boat. Like well, I, While that container ship yes. is moving. And that's yeah. literally where that is right now is there's yeah. a box of 2,000 books in the Somewhere in the, the middle of the Pacific. Yep, yep. And uh, and so yeah, and I, I let and, backers and know you're it's not it's important enough to know where that is. Right. Yeah, well, you, you could, actually there's 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 stuff now. Uh, there's a site I think called MarineTraffic.com, yeah. where you put in the name of your ship and you find the ship. Isn't the only yeah, the <laughs> only thing is that when it's in the middle of the Pacific, you need to spend like 150 dollars to get their satellite data. But you know when it. Le <laughs> But you know when it leaves. But you know it's moving. And you know when it hits port, you know? And it is nice to say, hey, the ship hit port, you know? But you don't get, like, day-to-day -day updates. Hey, now it's traveled 200 feet further, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, it really is. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it, I think the important thing is just to make sure backers know, okay, here's the next step. The next step, they're going to be loaded on the boat, and then it's going to be a month of nothing, you know? And that is normal, you know? That's, that's like, you're not going to hear from me for a month because there's going to be nothing to report. We're, I, I, the, what I told them from my last campaign is we're both in the passenger seat you know I've, I've had days where i will make my monthly update and i'm like so it's it's uh i know it's on a boat i know it's shipping and i will let you know you'll be the you'll be the third to know because <laughs> i will tell you as soon as i find out and then like an hour later I get a call I'm like oh it's at the distributors already and they're finished shipping and I hadn't heard about this until now <laughs> so I guess look for something in your mailbox soon with, with my last game but like day to day <laughs> Yeah, with my last game, it was um, my printer handled the shipping, so there was like two layers of removal. Like there was the shipper, 
and then the shipper was hired by the printer and then I hired the printer. So I was asking the printer, so do you have any details? And the printer had to go to the shipper to find the details. And you know, we don't know if the shipper subcontracted at all. So you know, I, it, there's at least two levels of removal there. So it's tough to be like, well, I'll tell you as soon as I hear, well, it might be exactly like Tim where I I don't know until it hits the- <laughs> Oh, you got your deck already. That's great. I hadn't heard it was <laughs> even in the US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, how many people here are doing board and card games or are expecting to? All right. And how many people are or are expecting to use RPGs? It's a bad idea. <laughs> it's an awesome idea. It's just really hard. RPGs, it's really hard. The reason I ask is because there's a, there's a big production difference, which is yes. RPGs these days are mostly done in book form. Uh, books are so cheap. And, oh yeah, and books are a really well understood technology. Um, and uh, board games tend to uh, have a lot of really unique requirements, which is why they're so neat. Uh, and, and it's also why they're so expensive to produce. And box and boxes are expensive. Boxes, also, yep, just boxes. boxes are expensive. And, but people expect boxes. Uh, game Salute, I think, recently shipped a game without a box. Yeah. Uh, and people weren't expecting. It's not like they said, "This game, by the way, this game won't have a box." You know, yeah. uh, the people got a bag and they opened the bag like a, like a baggy envelope, like a Jiffy mailer. They opened it up. It had some dice and some cards. <laughs> wow. So, but you know, uh, it's yeah, a yeah, little awkward. A, yeah. I mean, when a, when a game is coming in an envelope, I know that that's the case. They've gotten one. Of those. Yeah, 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 but uh, so, but uh, the bo boxes are expensive, you know, and that's another reason why board games are, you know, are pricier and they're tougher to make, and the the unit price is higher, you know, so the MSRP is higher because the boxes can add like three dollars to the MSRP to the unit cost, the and that's not cheap. Backstory cards cost about three times as much as the entire Zone setting guidebook. Wow. Well. The the box I used for the Backstory Cards Deluxe Edition cost about three times as much as an entire book I produced. That's just the box. On, on, on a unit price. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Um, That's mildly disturbing. Stupid boxes. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about this, this particular thing. Um, we keep talking about spreadsheets. Um, that spreadsheet can't lie, um, and the It can, answer... but it's a bad idea for it, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if somebody's paying it, like, okay. <laughs> as, as a conflict of interest. Um, have an agenda. It's yeah, very yeah, good yeah. at lying if you miss a decimal point, I thought. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's actually, there's an accountant just taught me a trick about that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so um, what you do is you, you start listing your line items, and the first one is, this is how much I'm getting paid to work on this. The next one is this is how much, um, like my illustrator or whoever is working out with you is my you know my partner. Put your people at the top, and your temptation once you see this number at the bottom is to be like, well, let's go up to those top numbers and start marking down mm -hmm. what we're gonna get. But you're not actually gonna get that money. You're gonna fuck up so many things. Like mm -hmm. like like, don't don't go taking out your seat belts mm -hmm. not to save weight. Yeah. Um, and so you're going to go down your head, like this is incoming shipping, this is outgoing shipping, this is manufacturing, mm -hmm. and you're going to wind up with, with a bunch of line items, and then at the end, you say... And you're like, wow, that's this book cost me $20 a piece to produce. Right, right, <laughs> right. That's insane. Uh, and at that point, you, you uh, yeah, well, I don't know, if you can sell your book for 60 bucks, that's cool. Um, uh, uh, but then at the very end, you say, all that... Uh, you might be tempted to say all that times 111%, uh, which will tell you what you need to raise with Kickstarter's um, uh, Kickstarter's take. But what you really want to do is go down that, with that with those numbers as precise as you can, erring on the side of everything costing more than you mm -hmm. thought. Get to the end and say, I'm off by, hey, I shit you not, 25 to 50%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you multiply that by 111%, and that's the amount that you need to raise. And if you say, Jesus, that's going to be $30,000, maybe I'll ask for $20,000. <laughs> you can't do two-thirds of your project. That's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So you can say, all right, I guess we've got to do this in black and white. We can say, all right, we have to do this with fewer pages. Don't skimp on your fucking people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it, might, it might be we can only do 10 illustrations instead of 30. Um, 
but that's just that's just changing you know the scale of what you want your illustrator changing to do. It's not, it's not, not paying, paying your, them less. Yeah, right. It's not. It's not. It's paying them less by asking them to do less. Yeah, right, right, right. And your illustrator will probably be like, well, but I want to do a good job. I'll do them all for that amount of money anyway. And then then you have to say, God damn it, I can't do that. That's not ethical to just pay them a mm-hmm. third as much as they were asking because they're illustrators and they're mm-hmm. not asking for enough money. And you want them to have enough time to uh, to take out of their Starbucks job to actually work on your project. <laughs> like, like all of us, you can tell the tone here, all of us are scraping by to make a thing because that's mm-hmm. not the way that you make things in our economy. The way you make, the way, sorry, that's not the way you make money in our economy is by making things. The way you make money in our economy is by buying and selling money. Mm-hmm. So, since that's not what we're doing, mm-hmm. since we're actually trying to fabricate elements of culture, uh, we get the shitty end of the stick. So don't, don't, don't pass that cost down. Don't pass that societal cost down any more than you have to. And your illustrators are going to cheap out on you in the wrong way. They're anyway. going to undercharge mm-hmm. you. So don't, don't pay them less. Mm-hmm. Do you have any other questions? Pretty grim, isn't it? <laughs> Who's anybody having second thoughts? Oh, god damn it! Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Joshua, you failed. <laughs> so, so, so number one, running a Kickstarter is dangerous. Don't do it. Number two, it's awesome. Totally do it. Uh, uh, but also, the important part is make your game. Making your game is the most important part. Yeah. And that doesn't mean selling your game and creating a business, because that is a very, very different thing mm-hmm. than making awesome games. Yeah. That also earns you very, very little money. That also mm-hmm. earns <laughs> very little money. Yeah. And it's, a way, it's way more work, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, like, so, like, you know, I started out making games because I needed a creative outlet. Like, I was working as a technician, and I'm like, I'm bored doing the same installation over and over and over again. i got to do something. And so I was just like, I would bring some index cards along and sort of sort out ideas and just do that. And that was fine for a while. And then I got involved in a playtest group and my game got better. I go, wow, this, this, this could be a real thing. And then I paid some illustrators and then I paid a graphic designer and then I started getting quotes and then I owed an extra $650 a month for about a year. <laughs> Um, so that was awesome. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and also my taxes got huge mm-hmm. and also more complicated. Mm-hmm. And I've been doing my taxes for you know, the last 20 years. So I did my own taxes and I still do that. And mm-hmm. it's still harder. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know more about it, so it's a little bit easier, but they're still more complicated. Yeah. Um, and I'm at risk because those are just dollars in my pocket. Uh, that are not in my pocket, but in a warehouse in the form of game cards. Mm -hmm. Uh, They are not money, (laughs) and Mm -hmm. I can't spend them. Mm -hmm. And so that's a problem. You can try. I can try. (laughs) It hasn't worked yet. (laughs) I did buy a copy of Dungeon World for that. Oh, well. (laughs) Because that worked out well. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Running a business is hard. Uh, If you want to run a business, really commit to running a business. if you don't want to run a business, don't do that. Mm-hmm. Because if you try to publish yourself, you will be running a business, straight up. There is a such a big desi- d- divide between uh, role playing games and board g- and card games in this respect, in that uh, you can do small quantities with a role playing game. You can print five hundred copies of the book. You can even set them up on, on as a PDF. Yeah, I mean, this is a hundred. These, yeah. these, these are these, by the way, are complete role playing games. Yeah. Uh, I did them in a run of a hundred. I, I, I played haven't. one yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yep. This one. yeah, yeah. And it's actually, pretty it's, awesome. it's yeah. the best role playing game ever. Yeah, it's, it's doing five bucks. Yep, <laughs> doing that as a board game, and I'm talking like a full board game with pawns. That's hundred co- copies is is difficult. I mean, there's is, is, is there's going to you cost you. Game Crafter you, probably be like eighty bucks a copy. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's it, yeah with Game Crafter. I mean, the, the 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 price wouldn't make sense. You know, you you can do it. It's just not going to make any financial sense. Um, so there's no way you can turn around and sell it and when I say make money I'm not saying oh make a living and buy a Lamborghini I'm, I'm saying uh, 
Is that what you do with a living? Yeah, yeah, just... <laughs> so, oh, weird. Yeah. I, I mean, just, just do it and sell uh, and sell enough for it to, mi- to not be, like, in the hole and have serious regrets, you know, because it's very easy when you do porn and card games to have regrets uh, because this business uh, with board and card games, you are you are creating a monster in your basement is really what it comes down to. Like uh, there's going to be a monster in your garage and it's going to look like a bunch of boxes. And I you like have, monsters in my garage, so yeah. I started a business. So you have to feed. I don't even have a garage, but you <laughs> I have don't to. Either. You have to feed this monster money constantly. Now, now, if you're up for it and you want to do it, like as Tim said, there are some awesome bits to it. You know. Um, but there is a lot of work involved, and you have to go in with your eyes open, and you have to know. Like I came in approaching this as a business, you know. Like, and to me, like there's a long-term plan for me. Like I am looking to, uh, you know, three or four down years, years down the road. Uh, like I'm also freelancing uh, to pay the bills, you know, while I'm getting the business on its feet. Um, and the reason I'm freelancing is so I can do stuff like this without having to like uh, beg and scrape uh, at a day job. Uh, and my day job was getting weird anyway. So there was like timing. But the important thing is you just have to know what you're in for. You have to know that this, especially when you're making a board and card game, you have to know that uh, this isn't just like you're going to get like a box of games and have it in the corner. And if it doesn't sell, you just have a box of games in the corner that you can laugh at and maybe throw out if you're feeling in a bad mood. You'll have one of those. No, you'll have, have 40 other boxes yes. of games. So, so I've Multiple got, extra refrigerators. So, I have, I, I have a st- so a friend of mine um, did this even before Kickstarter. Like he... You know, I, I asked him, why are you doing this? This is back when I said I would never publish my own games. Um, <laughs> you didn't say that. Yeah, I did say, I did say at one point, yeah. That, well, the Kickstarter, uh, you know, fulfillment, a lot of stuff changed. But uh, so this was before Kickstarter, before easy fulfillment, while printers were still requiring 3,000 copies, like requiring, like you said, can you give me 2,000 copies of my board game? They'd laugh at you. Uh, I'm not now, going to do yeah. that. Nowadays, you can say, can you give me 1,000 copies of my game? They'll say, sure, and they'll give you a unit price that's really high. They'll They'll, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll answer your phone call, but they'll give you a unit price. The price break generally happens around 2,000 copies, but the more you can print, the, the better. First, the first one. Yeah. And then it's okay. Yeah, but then... 5,000 is great. 5,000 is great, you have but... 5,000 games. Yeah, but... Oh, but so he got 3,000 copies of his game printed, and this was a full board game. Uh, and then one day, the magic day came, um, and the truck with the games came. And he's like, great, I'm going to put them all in my garage. Uh, and he was expecting boxes. He was expecting a bunch of boxes. And uh, the guy with the truck opened, and it was pallets. And he very, very lucky that the, that the truck driver you know, had one of those uh, mechanical lifts and a pallet jack. Otherwise, there's no way that was getting off the truck. You can't lift a pallet with your arms. Nope. That doesn't happen. Nope. Nope. My uh, mobile phone zero showed up in my warehouse, and it was literally, uh, it was, let's see that. So, all right, so in the corner, if, if it was in that corner, a pallet's about this big and mm-hmm. about this high. Mm-hmm. That turns out to be over 2,000 pounds of books. Mm-hmm. It, it, like, it's, it's a, I, and also, furthermore, that's what 4,000 books look, looks like. Like, it doesn't seem that big a deal, but it's really fucking heavy. It's really hard to move around. 5,000 little copies of Ghost Pirates, which is just like this little two-deck mm-hmm. box size, mm-hmm. takes up two pallets. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, if your game is bigger than that, <laughs> it's like... Deck of cards, yeah. You can print less than that. My friend, uh, my friend Chris Truder, uh, mm-hmm. who has been here in the past, mm-hmm. uh, his game Epigo, they did 2,000 copies. That I sounds think? about right. And it was <laughs> 11 pallets. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. this which was takes a up a lot of space. Yes. And that's a lot of warehousing, and you know you're going to pay warehousing, you're going to pay taxes, you know. The, so you have to go in with your eyes open. I mean, you know, none of the stuff kills you. You know, this is not stuff not that is made. Yeah. yeah, not by itself. <laughs> but so you have to up. go in with your eyes open. You have to know that this is going to happen. Yeah. So, would you advocate more towards Kickstarter or finding a publisher to get your game? For 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 your first game, for your first board game. Kickstarter. You really? Why do you say that? Absolutely. For a board game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do it your fucking self. Otherwise, you're just somebody else's father. And uh, you, like you, it endang- you will not be going into an IP negotiation knowing 
how to handle yourself. I, I have to disagree with that. At least with a board, boarding card. I, I say go with a publisher for your first game. First, maybe second game. Uh, because there are a lot of subtleties to the business, and there's a lot of ways to screw it up. And when you work with a publisher, you get a front seat view, but you get very little of the culpability. And generally, I, I'm going to be with, I'm going to agree with Josh on one thing. The publisher is probably going to screw some things up. Publishers probably screw a lot of things up. Um, you're gonna go, you're gonna appear at a con, and the publisher's not gonna be showing your game at the con, or maybe the publisher's not even gonna be at the con. Um, there are so many ways that can go wrong with a publisher, but you get to see them, you know. And you get to you get to take on a very low amount of risk. Yes, that is the biggest thing. That is, is the biggest yes, thing. giving away the thing you made is 100% risk. It, I mean, yes, at that point, at, at that point, especially if you wind up in a position where they control the IP, you have lost control of the thing that you were working but on. But that's why you signed a contract with a sunset clause. That is the most okay. So in five yeah. years, when you're a much better game designer anyway, then then you can go back and and, and well, use maybe, this IP that you don't want anymore. But it's it's usually two or three years. You know, it, like if it, if if the game doesn't get pub printed within uh like i think it was a year and a half or two years sure, in one of my contracts sure, right. then the rights revert oh, back oh, to oh, me yeah, yeah yeah no I, i'm i'm talking about them like not 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 going forward with it but screwing it up in oh, some way yeah, damaging, but I was, damaging your name and yeah, damaging your brand i was i was going to get to that other bit is yeah it uh one of my contracts has a provision they have a definition of out of print uh so if the game is like out of stock at the distributor and they decide to uh or the at the, uh, at their distribution consolidator and they decide to not reprint after i think one year the rights revert back you know and those are clauses you need that is the most important clause in the contract That's it's true. more important than your percentage it's more important than your name on the box although your name on the box i think is very important the most important right is you never ever ever sign away the rights to your game in perpetuity oh, yeah. Never, because that that is getting rid of one of your kids. You know, that's yeah. the, you're selling your kid uh, away, and you'll never see your kid again. Um, but that said, yeah, it it is one of your kids. Um, it, a lot of it depends on the publisher you're going with. It depends on what kind of risk you want to take on. I mean, yeah, yeah, you're right. It is it is risk in that you're risking that your publisher will get rid of it. But um, it is also a different kind of angst. You know, it's it's uh, you don't feel. Like it's it's a totally different feeling when someone else is screwing it up instead of you screwing it up. Right. And so, when wait, I actually want to yeah. say yeah. one last thing. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So um, uh, I didn't realize there's, there's actually there's actually a, a phase before that, mm -hmm. which is you know, you know print it out, draw it in magic marker, work and work and work on it in places like this, get it to a point where you're like, all right, I think I know how this works. Make a couple of prototypes with game crafters. Mm -hmm. um, Sell them at cost if you got to. It's I mean if you can make a profit, do mm. because like I said, you'll screw stuff up. But so if it if it costs you fifteen dollars to assemble your game, definitely sell it for thirty dollars. That's definitely within the market. You're talking too fast to me. Oh, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. So if if your cost winds up being fifteen dollars, people are very comfortable paying forty five dollars for a board game. Sell it for that. If your cost is forty five dollars, sell it for forty five dollars because what you really want is feedback. What I missed was the very beginning. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. So you can have short runs done at a place called Game Crafters. The, the GameCrafter.com. Right, right. Don't forget yes. the article, because yeah. that's some other guy. Uh, mm. uh, and what you can do there is get something close to professional looking, uh, and you can start engaging with people commercially with it, and they, they interact differently with your game when it looks completed. They stop giving you terrible advice, for one thing, because it looks like it's done. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, do that, and then think then you can start. Really true, but <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Um, uh, and at that point, what you're doing is you're generating the fans <coughs> who you're going to need for your Kickstarter anyway. You're starting yes. to create. Well, generating what? You're generating fans. You're generating yeah. the fans that you need because don't the first thing you need to on Kickstarter is an audience. Oh, let's let's call it a few dozen people to show up and uh, throw in because they've been waiting for your Kickstarter to start. I run the Indie Bazaar upstairs over by role playing, uh, the role-playing area, and the deal with the Indie Bazaar is you get 100% of uh, the sales of your, of your game, minus your cut of costs, which at Metatopia, I think this year we might have bought some pens, 
I think those were our costs. <laughs> so like between that and like uh, some processing fees. Yeah, there's there's like credit card processing minimal. fees and stuff like that. So if you sell a hundred dollars of stuff, you're probably going to get something like ninety seven dollars mm. of of that. If you sell through a retailer, you're probably going to get something like fifty dollars of that, mm -hmm. uh, maybe less. And if you're doing boutique pricing because you're doing short runs, uh, then you're never going like you'll lose money. You'll lose money. Uh, that's that's mm -hmm. negative profit and that's bad news. Uh, but it's not only proper to sell here, but that's the reason this is here, because there's there's no such thing as a, a as a piece of art that doesn't cost somebody money, and the idea is for the artist to not be the one paying for it. Sure. Um, so it's actually extremely important to me that uh, people be able to use places like this for for yeah. commerce because it's how, like that's it, it's not it, there. The idea that somehow the creators shouldn't worry their pretty little heads about the money, you will notice mm -hmm. who that benefits, and that benefits all those middlemen. Mm -hmm. It doesn't benefit the customers because they're paying for all the middlemen, and it doesn't be benefit the creator, and it particularly doesn't benefit those people if that creator can't get time off their cafe job yeah. to work on their thing. There's one more thing I wanted to add on. I know we keep on adding on, but uh, if you are going to go down the Kickstarter route, um, if there's any way that you're working on multiple designs, your smallest design should be your first design on Kickstarter. Yeah. If you fail, you want to fail small. Fail little. Yeah. yeah. So, um, like I had, cho like I was thinking about putting the networks on earlier in this year, and I started with a party game instead. Uh, and there was a few reasons. Number one, the party game was a little more advanced, but number two, the party game was smaller in scope. And uh, you know, I learned a lot. There's a lot that I learned from the, from that project. Uh, but uh, I'm very glad I had those lessons uh, with a small party game instead of a big box strategy game. So Feel start small. Often, but small. I think that's, yeah. that's good advice. All right, what was the question over? Uh, two questions. Uh, actually, first of all, very passionate debate. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really interesting because you have a really good spectrum mm -hmm. of people up here. Yeah. I'm, I'm one of those middle grounders. So that's why he's in the actually, middle. That's why I'm in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first question was, uh, simple. what exactly is a sunset clause? Is that when the... A sunset that clause that? means that it expires automatically under certain circumstances. Okay. So uh, in what Gil was saying, it's like if this game goes out of print, like there and there's a definition of out of print, mm -hmm. after, after that date, if copies are not back in print, the contract is done, and My, the rights of the game the rights are back. revert accordingly. Yep. That's what that means. Okay. Uh, the second question is, I've seen a lot of discussion in the last uh, day or so about um, sort of like what, 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 the, what the bleak financial outlook is if you kind of self-publish and go to Kickstarter and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What is the flip side if you go through a publisher? Like you, you have the safety of, you know, you're not really culpable, but what, what is the trade-off? The tr trade-off is if your game is successful, uh, as the guy from Mayfair explained, if your game is successful, you might be able to afford dinner at Applebee's from the royalty check. Right. Yeah. The, your percentage will be small. Tiny. Uh, so, so even less money than, than the it will, it, it will be yeah. It will be less money, but also less risk. And mm -hmm. that is, and that is the, the, the single biggest, and it's not the most important trade-off, as mm -hmm. you'll hear yeah. from Joshua. Yes. But it is the biggest trade-off. Yes. You lose control. You lose uh, cash uh, mm -hmm. as a as a potent, you, you lose cash potential, but you also lose cash at risk. Yep, and you also lose incentive is another thing. You, I, I, Josh, I, I know you were going to talk about uh, the other thing you lose, which is probably uh, control. Yeah, yeah, IP rights. Yeah, um, which is that uh, in some places in the world, it's actually illegal to use contracts, uh, IP contracts, the way that we do here. Um, because in, in the United States, you are literally allowed and usually required given a, on a given contract to sign away your moral rights. Mm -hmm. And that means that they don't have to say you did it. They don't have to say um, that it came from anybody else's idea. They don't have to put anybody's name on it. Um, now, that contract might say, and it reverts back to you under these circumstances, which is the, the most readily accessible of it, of which is probably in five years, we have to renegotiate this, like this contract ends in five years. But uh, the, a big part of that is my game Human Contact is, my game Human Contact is um, about, uh, it's hard science fiction, uh, it's queer friendly, it's, uh, there's not a white person in it, 
and there's no way that Hasbro would ever take two mm -hmm. looks at that kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. So that's it. and the last thing I know that you want to uh, want to is that uh, you, once you sign your rights away, you, the, your royalties are so small that you have no financial incentive to to, to demo your game. So it's entirely up to your uh, publisher to demo your game for you. I mean, you can do it, but you're not gonna. There's no financial incentive to do so, and you'll probably lose money demoing your own game. Talk to Envoy if you want free demo. Yeah. Free demo stuff. Yes. That yes. Uh, Double Exposure runs an Envoy program. I know this is not yeah. really. Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I'm, I'm not going to endorse Envoy. I, I think there's a problem with the direction of money flow. There's money flows <laughs> from artists in Envoy, and unless the policy has changed. No, uh, it is um, the companies are paying Envoy to demo the company. Doesn't matter who owns it. Could be the publisher. Could be the creator. Whoever is paying us is doing it to get demos out there. Right. So, right. so, so I, what, I, your, what your I do like Envoy. Is. I'm an Envoy member, but I'm a publisher, and it's really a publisher thing. It's not a designer thing. Don't join Envoy if you're only a designer, because it really you you need the revenue it is, it is directly that, that, for it to make that, sense. The calculations don't make sense. Yeah, the calculations don't make not, sense not if you're just a designer. Like, yeah. I haven't seen numbers. Yeah. Recently. Okay, I think we're done yeah, over here. We gotta right? get kicked out. Okay, all right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Woo! We'll be right out here if, if anybody wants to talk. <laughs>